Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Roger Destrudy. And as you know, every month we strive to bring you an exciting program about your county government. And today we are going to exceed expectations because we have the Transportation Director with us, Mr. Greg Schnell. Welcome, Greg. Thanks, Adam. It's a pleasure to be here, Roger. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. And it's that time of year. The, the roads are starting to get slick and the snow plows are out and it can be a dangerous time of the year and one where our highway department really shines because obviously we rely on Greg and his staff to get to and from work and school and whatever we need in this community. So Greg, welcome again and, and please share a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure, thanks. Um, I started out about 25 years ago working for Manitowoc County and I started at the bottom uh, being a labor equipment operator, uh, worked my way through the process as a foreman and obviously back into a superintendent's position and, and fortunately I was lucky enough to land here to be your, your highway commissioner. Uh, over the years I've learned a lot about construction, maintenance, um, just the things I learned there and working with the DOT and, uh, and how they're, what their philosophies are in, in trying to provide the best services we possibly can and I, I hope I brought most of that with me for the last seven years I've been here. Seven years already. How the time has flown. And tell us a little bit about the, you know, the highway department. You started as highway commissioner. Obviously now you're our transportation director overseeing both the highway division and the airport. And we're going to get into that more in a minute. But tell us a little bit about the highway area and how many staff you have budget. We have uh, 87 employees. That's uh, including myself, our mechanics. We have a uh, full um, um, engineering and surveying department that includes our, uh, our mechanics, I think, and administration people. Um, we have a budget of around 14 to 16 million dollars depending upon the year. Our, um, transport, our airport division adds about $400,000 to that as well. So, and that uh, has a staff of um, uh, three full-time and one part-time staff. And yeah. we're currently yeah. working on filling one position. And one of our big four departments, Highway, Sheriff, Health and Human Services, and, and Rocky Knoll. So what did you say, about a 14 to $16 million budget? That's correct. Depending yeah. on the year. And a, and a lot of that budget, obviously, is road maintenance, infrastructure. But uh, this time of year, especially, you got to get your equipment ready, purchase salt, and, and prepare for winter. What all goes into ramping up for winter? Our preparation starts with salt. We have to uh, look at our inventories. We start looking at that in May already so we can procure salt for the, um, the remainder of that year and the following year's winter. Uh, we average about uh, 10 to 12,000 tons of salt a year, um, which ranges about $60, $61 a ton. So we spend anywhere between six to $600,000 to $750,000 just in salt purchases alone. That's not implying it. So we budget, the county board budgets about uh, $2.1 million a year. That's the uh, overtime, the application, the salt included in that, uh, blades for the trucks, um, snow fence installation, and um, marking, that type of thing that, that we need to have prepared for winter. So it's, it's huge. It is huge. Big expense, and I've heard you say it before, depending on winter conditions, that can have a big impact on the budget. And put that in perspective a little bit for our viewers. You know, you, you get a one, two, even just a three-inch snowfall out there. It really requires about the same manpower and, a, and amount of equipment as if you get 10, 12, 13 inches of snow. Is that right? It, uh, it varies. Uh, one to two inches, we're going to send out 43 trucks. That's including the state and the county. And then we take care of um, 11 out of the 15 townships as well for their snow removal. So in a, in a three-inch uh, three event, we're going to send those 42 trucks, 43 trucks. Uh, if we get a little wind with that, we're also going to uh, add our, our 12 graders as well. Um, okay. So, and then if it ramps up even further than that, when we get to 10 to 12 inches, we'll send out our Oshkosh trucks with big V-plows and wings on so we can shelf and push the snow back. Gives us a little bit more horsepower to get the stuff. We don't technically like to use those too often. Uh, some of them are getting up there in age, um, so it's a little bit more difficult to find parts, but we are one of the few counties that has a few left just in the event of that big blast that uh, we need to take care of. And how many roads are you carrying for during the winter? Our county trunk system uh, is comprised of 450 miles. We have uh, 465 miles of township road that we're uh, responsible for and 170 miles of state road. And the reason I asked you that is because People sometimes lack patience this time of year, and if we're going to be safe out there, you got to slow down and you have to be patient. And when you're dealing with over a thousand miles of roadway, you're not going to get to everybody's road first. 
Nope. So talk a little bit about that. What can people do to, to better understand, to take some time? What are your priorities, number one? And then number two, when they come upon a, a plow truck or someone you know, working out there, what's the best way to manage that situation? Well, the, um, in an average snowstorm, we, uh, we'll start, if it's overnight snowstorm, we will start at 4 o'clock in the morning. If it's uh, a little lighter snow, let's just say 1 to 2 inches, we'll get going at 4. If it starts to get a little bit more than that, we'll come out at 3 o'clock. Um, we're going to hit our state and our county roads first. Uh, simultaneously, those guys will be uh, dispersed. And, and um, as we can get those cleaned up and get everybody to where they need to be off of those roads, then we'll start moving into our municipal roads that we have to take care of. If, you know, we just need time. That's what it is. It's nothing that we can control. We, we want to be safe when we're operating our equipment, so we have to take our time in pushing that snow. Um, give us space. You come, a, come upon a snow plow, give us a couple hundred feet. They have a very difficult time seeing behind them, especially when they're using, we, we've just this year we've added uh, quad axle trucks to our fleet, which are uh, it's just a huge truck that it's hard to see what's behind you. Um, so if you give us the space, give us the time, we'll get, to, we'll get you where you need to be, but you just got to be patient, give yourself a little time to start out earlier in the morning, and obviously slow down. We don't want to have an issue like they did down south near Milwaukee with the 60 cars that piled up. I know from time to time any of us or board members might get a call from a constituent saying, doggone it, that plow truck just went by and my mailbox got wiped out. And I've heard you give me this explanation a number of times that it really depends on the weight of the snow and the conditions out there. So what generally is the cause for someone losing a mailbox? And then secondly, what do people do? Well, as you can imagine, when you have a uh, 10 or 12 foot snow plow and then you add a 13 or 12 foot wing on the end of that and you're taking the snow from the center of the road all the way to the shoulder, if the truck's going 25 miles an hour, by the time it hits the end of the wing, it's coming off a lot faster. That snow and that volume, depending upon that weight, will take off of a mailbox instantly, even if our guy's going 25 miles an hour if it's not secured properly. But it's the snow hitting the mailbox, not the that's, wing. That's correct. So folks are clear on that. So when we get the call, what our action is, is that we will send out our shed supervisor from that local area to investigate whether we hit it, backed over it, and it has happened that we wrecked them and, and, and did hit them. Um, if, if there's no physical evidence of us hitting it with the wing or the plow, it is the responsibility of the homeowner to fix that. If it's us, we will replace it or fix it with a like, I should say that it would be a, just a normal mailbox that you'd pick up at Fleet Farm or Menards. So again, it's more often than not just the weight of the snow. If it's a heavy, wet snow coming off that at 25 plus miles an hour, that can damage it. And in those instances, the owner's responsible, but if, it, if it's our fault where the wing literally hits it, then obviously we'll replace that. And they contact the highway department. That's and correct. Very good, very we'll good. Send somebody out. And last question before I turn it over to Roger. Uh, what about um, driveway entrances and you know the easements along there? What's the responsibility of the county versus the responsibility of the, of the landowner? Your, your driveway is your responsibility, and what, what we're running into, we see more and more issues of, uh, of people pushing their snow across the road in order to get rid of it or, or uh, just to have it out of their yard. The county does have an ordinance against that. It's an uh, ordinance that uh, placing things, obstructions in the right-of-way. Um, the fine is not much. It's only $10, but um, I know a lot of people don't like the fact when we go and, and visit with them and say, hey, don't do this anymore, but when you look at it from our perspective, um, when there's a pile of snow that's typically not there, and if it's not pushed down level with the ditch, as we go through our freeze-thaw cycles throughout the winter months, that turns into a rock. If we hit that with our wing or our plow, one, it'll damage the truck, and two, it could send our truck across the road into, into oncoming traffic and cause a severe accident, and uh, that's not something any one of us want to deal with. At that point, when it's placed in, the, in, in our right-of-way as an obstruction, it then is the responsibility of the person that placed it there. So there is going to be some shared liability with those types of situations. Very good. And as you said, though, we're not looking to fill people's end of the driveway up. When we come by and plow, it's their responsibility to clear that, not, not ours. We don't want to put it there on purpose. We don't want to deal with the snow anymore than anybody else does. So. Right. Very good. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Adam. Uh, the uh, Having served on the county board for a number of years and on the local town board for 12 years, I have maybe a 
more of an appreciation than some people do of how the uh, highway department helps local municipalities and we work together. You offer a service and, uh, and, and we receive uh, a good service for that and we don't have to buy equipment as expensive as, as uh, at the local level so it, it uh, works both ways. But uh, and another thing, not just the snow plowing, but in the summer months, uh, would you tell us a little bit about your summer operations and how the uh, blacktop plant fits in and how, how you work with local municipalities with these things? Sure. We, um, we do have an asphalt plant, as Roger mentioned. It's, uh, we produce anywhere between 60 and 70,000 tons of asphalt a year. Um, and that is shared on our county system on our town system as well as the state. We don't, we're not allowed to do a lot of stuff on the state, but patching, uh, that type of stuff, we can take care of for them. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous asset to all of us as taxpayers because it, it, helps, it does help control the cost of, of having to purchase that outside from a different vendor. Um, along with that, we also have a crushing operation where we have uh, contracts with some um, local property owners where we produce and, and, and create the aggregate. So we're not having to buy a lot of that and haul it into our asphalt plant. We're in a situation where, where it's all stationary and it does control or reduce the cost of our asphalt. Um, the other uh, areas that we can we assist in is, is mowing operations um, with the townships, um, patching, uh, ditching. There's, there's, there's quite an onslaught of things that we offer um, that helps control the cost and uh, you can use all of our county-owned resources. And uh, getting back to the blacktop plant a little, a uh, couple of years ago we, we purchased uh, 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 let's see the wrap system and you're able to use recycled material uh, if sometimes people see a blacktop being ground up it can be used do you want to explain that a bit sure as as years uh, have progressed on, on a lot of our highways we continue to put overlays on which could be between an inch and a half to two inches and we keep on raising that pavement year after year or not a year after year but every 10 years or so when there's a, a surface treatment done to it Eventually, you start to lose your shoulders and your and your slopes going into your ditches, and also uh, messes kind of with the profile with uh, the roads coming onto it or driveways. So we want to knock that down. So we can take those, uh, take a milling machine, um, come through, mill off that top couple inches, whatever we want to take off. We haul it back to the plant, recrush it, put it back through, and utilize the oil and the aggregates that are in there. And we're saving ourselves anywhere between three to four out four dollars a ton that we don't have to make virg out of virgin materials. So it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous savings for us and has paid for itself, I would say, almost twice already. And even in villages, you often see the curbing, and the curbing is in good shape, so that gets milled off so there's not a, the, the curb is lost and there's no, nowhere to go with the water Correct. also. Correct, yep. Uh, what does your department do uh, if there's emergency in the summer? Uh, how, how do you handle that and do you work with the Sheriff's Department or how just how does that work? If it's during the off hours, yes, we're paid by the Sheriff's Department. We have uh, on-call staff that are uh, available at any time. And uh, one thing about highway departments is, and, and we're kind of the, um, uh, I guess the one of the last call, first calls, but the least visible. We're, we're there for the traffic control and setting up the perimeters and a lot of times with chainsaws. So our, our application, we have to have enough stuff um, in order as far as uh, controlling traffic and setting up detours. So we have specific trucks that are set up for that. We have specific trailers with enough uh, signage on them to, so we can make our detours longer if there's a bridge out or that type of thing. So when you look at the highway department, it's not just putting asphalt down, rebuilding roads and snow plowing. There's a lot of other emergencies that we're involved in. If it's heavy wind or hail or uh, you name it, flooding, we're going to be involved in it. Roger, did he just say that they control traffic with the use of chainsaws? <laughs> it's just something like that by, that's by what, dropping that's a tree what. in the way. That stops I them. see. Yeah. I see. <laughs> they have to go a different direction. Yeah. There you go. Well, it, it's much appreciated. Uh, sometimes the windstorms not only affect the electrical lines when they get knocked down, but people are sometimes trapped. They can't get around on dead end roads and everything. So sometimes it's just a matter of getting the tree out of the way and clearing up the debris afterwards, just exactly. opening it up to traffic. Yep. So that's always appreciated. We do have a, a large project scheduled for, last, uh, for this, this coming year and we had some funds coming from the state and that's the 
Dairyland Drive and LS project. You want to explain to our listeners how that worked out and what the problems are and how they were solved? Sure. We uh, we worked with the town of Mosul um, as far as uh, what their need was and what our need was. And I'll start with our need first of all. On County Trunk LS, north of the Whistling Straits Golf Course or north of County Trunk MM, um, the bluff was eroding away due to um, some groundwater problems as well as the elevation of the lake. Um, it's gotten to the point now where it's become dangerous that the road almost needs to be closed um, if we don't do something immediately. So we started probably back in 2010 to develop where we're going to end up with this road and, and um, at this point we are going to be moving the road to the west of the properties alongside the, the, the lake uh, in that area. Along with that though we've had some participation from the state to um, I guess integrate our systems if you will with a town road versus a county trunk and we're going to be swampy roads with the affected communities along County Trunk LS which is the town of Sheboygan, town of Mosul, town of Centerville and the village of Cleveland and Manitowoc County. The counties will be taking over Dairyland Drive which was an old federal highway which is built to a very good standard with concrete uh, big wide shoulders and that's going to be where we want to try to force the bulk of the heavy traffic or the most of the traffic and an LS will be created into a town road which um, they would like to limit it to traffic as much as possible at least the, the heavy traffic. So when this is all said and done hopefully by the end of September next year we'll have all new pavement coming out of the city of Sheboygan all the way into the village of Cleveland on LS as well as on Dairyland Drive. Um, Dairyland Drive's name <clears throat> at this point hasn't been uh, changed yet. Um, we're working through some of the, the issues with that. Same with LS. It will no longer be it'll, be, it'll be Dairyland Drive as far as an address goes, but as far as the designation of whether it's going to be DL, DS, DD, whatever that's going to be, okay. will be named probably sometime in, in uh, early January. And as far as uh, LS goes, my assumption is it's going to be Lakeshore Road because out of the four municip five municipalities, four of them are already using Lakeshore Road for an address, one is not. So um, there would be a minimal change there uh, when it does happen. So uh, all in all, it's about uh, 70,000 tons of asphalt that will be going in that corner of the, of the uh, county. Um, we're getting $4 million of uh, f outside funding from the state of Wisconsin to help assist this. And um, by September, I hope my gray, my, my gray hair will start to turn black again. <laughs> well, thank you, Greg, for all the work that you and your crew do to keep uh, the roads safe in the winter and uh, upgrade them in the summer. Thank Thanks you very again. much. And it was interesting listening to Roger uh, set the stage a little bit because obviously he is in a unique position as both county board chair He's been on the county board for nearly 30 years and, and worked in, in, the t in the town of Holland and he truly does appreciate that relationship between the county and the towns and all the good work that happens. And we talk a, about, a lot about shared services and sharing resources and I think our highway department under Greg's leadership has been an absolute model of working together. I know Greg has really raised the bar to make sure that we're providing good services to the towns and municipalities but also he's doing it with less staff. I've been here 15 years now and there was a point where we had about 115, 120 highway department employees and now we have 87. So Greg, like most departments, has streamlined and, and um, done his best to work with limited resources and yet at the same time I think we've maintained an excellent service and continue to make good things happen in the community. So we thank you, Greg. Thank you. And speaking of doing more with less, there's been a lot of consolidations in the county. and One of them was consolidating the highway department with the airport department. So we now have one department head rather than two, which is Greg as our transportation director. And let's shift gears a little bit to the airport. Uh, we have one of the nicest airports in the state of Wisconsin. It's a public airport. It's one that uh, Chuck Mayer, you may recall that name, was our airport manager for probably around 30 years as well, did a wonderful job working for Sheboygan County, and we continue to do good work out there. What's the most uh, recent new development that's in the plans? 
Well, the, um, we, we did get some federal funding for the apron area out in front of the Aviation Heritage Center. That's our last remaining piece of, con uh, of asphalt that's, that was put in 20 plus years ago and starting to fail. Some of the seal coat material that's on there is getting sucked up into some of the gen jet motors and obviously they, those two aren't conducive. So um, that construction project did start a little bit this fall. We put in an exit or a haul road in order to uh, uh, shave some time off the construction project for next year, but that will be starting. Um, hopefully we're getting going in April, ground conditions permitting. Um, should be hopefully completed where our push is to have everything done by wings and wheels if that happens this year, which is Father's Day weekend. And uh, that's our that's our drive. If, if at all possible, maybe it won't be entirely open, but we'll be able to park some planes on the new concrete that'll be installed. So that's that's our push. So we've made multi-million dollar improvements with extending the runways. We've now fenced in the entire airport. We've improved the parking. You're now looking to improve the, the tarmac or the apron area. Yep. We have the Heritage Museum out there, which is a beautiful amenity. And uh, you really have done all this with the same number of staff. Just how enormous is the airport department staff? And then also, just how big is the airport uh, state, when you look at it statewide? The, um, our airport staff uh, consists of an airport superintendent, which we're in the process of hiring for now. We have two full-time and one half-time individual. They take care of, of um, plowing all the runways, which I, 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 if I have a committed memory, it, you know, it goes to five miles, but they're real wide and, and uh, you have to plow along, around the lights and that type of thing. Um, so it takes a fair amount of time, plus we have 1,030 acres that we maintain of grass. That's inside and outside of the fence. So those are all of our responsibilities, the lighting, the navigation system, the, um, the fencing, the gates. Um, so that's an enormous staff that we have out there. Yeah. And, and they do a wonderful job. We are, um, I'm finding out more and more as I get into this job that uh, we're recognized as one of the uh, jewels of, of, the, of general aviation. We also are you know, home for um, 39 uh, individual private hangars and, and I think 13 commercial and industrial hangars. So, we have a busy airport. Um, I, there's a lot of people, I think we run through about 800,000 gallons of, of jet fuel a year. Uh, and so that, that's a lot of stuff. And we have an FBO provider out there that uh, supplies those airports with that fuel. And, and, um, and we're working on building more of those relationships uh, with, with more commercials as we, as we have the property to, to facilitate that. If memory serves, it's about the 10th busiest public airport in the state. And you said, and I meant that tongue and cheat, obviously, uh, three and a half staff essentially maintaining the entire multi-million dollar airport that is critical to our economic development and success as a community. That's correct. It's, uh, it, it takes a lot to get it done. The, the guys that we have out there have been doing it for a long time and they take a lot of pride in keeping it up. So as you, in the few minutes we have remaining, I know that you're always looking down the road on necessary infrastructure improvements, things happening at the airport. You just talked about two key projects, Dairyland Drive and LS, the apron at the airport. What else do you have on slate for next year or in the next five years? We're looking at, um, uh, not next year, but the following year, putting in a uh, safety improvement down at the intersection of County Trunk A and EE, -E, just south of the Deer Trace Mall. Um, we've had uh, numerous accidents there and we did receive some federal funding to build we're looking at as a roundabout. Uh, that'll be happening in 2015. Um, we're working on design of County Trunk OK, where we left off this year at the intersection of uh, OK and EE to go south down to the interstate. Um, that would be a, a 2016 uh, project. We have a couple bridges. County Trunk DE is a bridge that's going to get replaced this year. Um, next year, I think we have County Trunk FF. There's a bridge that's um, yeah, it's got some uh, um, structure problems on that we're going to take care of. So we're looking out pretty far in advance. We have some pretty big, significant investments to make in our infrastructure. And we have probably about 16 to 18 miles of, besides what we're doing on LS, we have about 16 to 18 miles of overlay to do next year, um, some seal coating and a bunch of maintenance work. So there's a lot of things that we're picking and parting and we're, we're getting it done, but there's a lot of miles to cover. The work goes on and, and as we all know, it gets more and more expensive, whether it's uh, new blacktop or the cost of oil or what have you, it, it's getting increasingly expensive to maintain and improve these roads. 
Yep, equipment's getting larger and it's getting more expensive. We just uh, purchased two new snowplow trucks, and uh, you know they're three hundred thousand dollars a piece. Uh, and years ago, that was you know it's considerably less, but it's 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 a cost of doing business. And uh, um, unfortunately, we have the other animal, and that's uh, you got construction, you got winter, and we all heard what what winter can cost us. Um, so it's just a, a constant moving cyclical thing for us it's just the change of the season so. i think when you did start here seven years ago your hair was jet black <laughs> <laughs> i know budgets can get us all going final question before we wrap up here highway 23 there's been discussion of you know four lanes all the way to fond du Lac for some time i think now they're targeting 2015 or 2016 to really get rolling on that but living in the town of plymouth and driving that road every day it seems every year there's work going on on Highway 23, and most recently it's been the J turns that I think some folks are still getting accustomed to. Briefly explain who does that work and why did they make those changes? The, uh, the changes were made um, for the fact of, of safety. There was, uh, each one of those intersections had somewhat of, of um, accident history at them. And uh, they, so the state applies for the same types of funding that I get. So they some federal funding in order to uh, improve those intersections or make them safer. Um, it's not out there yet if they're the best thing that we can possibly put out. Another one built um, up in Green Bay that was built last summer as well. So, uh, from a timing standpoint, but it's up that work. Um, they have a private contractor come in and build them, and it's, it's for safety improvements to, to try to keep us all safe as traveling because obviously we all know. Uh, like 50 that state work. Correct. To doctors there that I know I'm getting a little impatient with it all, but in the end, they've got much better. It's, um, you know, construction. Such a short little time window to get everything completed, and that's when we, you know, uh, it's hard for me to, to in summer, <laughs> but we need them, we need it on both ends. The work needs to be completed. Uh, we can only work during the day in most cases. We are doing trying to do a little bit more night work now, but uh, it's it's still an inconvenience no matter what because people are constantly moving. We got shifts and uh, manufacturing that has to go on, so we um, we have to work around everybody and work well in the sandbox, if you will. Well, Greg, thanks again for joining us today, and thank you for joining us. Today. I hope you learned a little bit more about our highway department and airport, and if you have additional questions or something you'd like Greg to think about or respond to, don't hesitate to contact him directly. He's one of 18 departments, uh, one of 19 excellent department heads, and I hope as you got a feel for really making good things happen in Sheboygan County. We didn't talk about it, but Greg also collaborates very with our planning and conservation department, Aaron, and Aaron Brault, our, our department head there on the Old Plank Road Trail improvements and other non-motorized trail improvements. And next month, that's who's gonna be here, Aaron Brault, planning and conservation director to talk about the very important work they've been doing, not only with trail development, recreational opportunities, but the huge, huge uh, achievement of cleaning up and dredging the Sheboygan River and Harbor. So Greg, thanks again for joining us. Thank you and your excellent highway department employees for the good work you do. And thank you for joining us. Until then, on behalf of Roger Distrudi and myself, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year.